Got it. Great. So um, before we get started, we have a couple of community um, agreements that we usually remind each other about just to set um, an intention for the time that we're together. And I'll quickly go through them. So the first one is take space and make space. So we encourage you to unmute or to put your questions in the chat, but um, making make sure you make space for other folks as well. This is a brave space. We want to cultivate productive dialogue where we can speak honestly and critically from our own experience toward the end of mutual learning and growth. We have zero tolerance for hate, discrimination or prejudice. Be kind and mindful of the tone and language you use. Be careful, especially about nonverbal cues, about humor and sarcasm. We don't often translate well online and um, we encourage you to be open to growing and learning. Um, tech specific ones is keep your microphone muted unless you're speaking. Um, that helps to reduce background noise. Feel free to use the chat for any thoughts, responses and questions. We encourage you to respond to respond and challenge ideas and not people. And also, as we always encourage you to feel free to take space for yourself. If you need to step away, if you need to drink some water, feel free to do that. So, um, Kristen and Anthony, welcome to our workshop. We're so happy to have you. So just to give you some foundation about where we're at. So this is actually our last formal workshop. And we started by talking about the New York City food system and then talked um, even more broad, broadly about the Northeast. And then um, we have been out to Governor's Island Teaching Garden first to be introduced to their farming practices and just like to, to uh, urban farming. And then we went back and had a more, um, a more uh, involving uh, day where we, we actually worked on the farm with them and we got to do things like prepare the seedlings for the next year. Um, we got to do a bunch of like harvesting um, and I'm trying to remember what, and some other people prepared the beds for um, cover crops. So we've had some like really great discussions about food, about waste, about composting, about food pantries. Um, um, rescuing food. So I feel like we've had some really great conversations thinking about food. And um, this, this conversation specifically, we'd like to learn about like the food space in New York City, like what is going on, what people are doing. Um, and we're excited to just hear from you and um, yeah, to share what you guys are involved in and what you know. Um, I am going to let Kristen introduce herself and, and you can pass it on to Anthony. Sure, um, so my name is Kristen Fields and I am the director of the School Gardens Program at Grow NYC. And so what we do is we work with any high school in New York City that wants to start a learning garden. And that could be pots on a windowsill, it could also be like a really fancy rooftop garden. It could be like raised beds outside. It's really whatever they want to do. We're happy to help support. Um, and so I won't go too much into the details right now. I'll let Anthony introduce and then we can, we'll talk more later. So pass it to you, Anthony. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm Anthony Guevara. I used to, I'm a former farm stand manager for the uh, last summer and through the winter as well. And currently I'm a farm manager with Project Eats. It's another nonprofit that works uh, in food equity as well, specifically in, in farming and uh, food desert areas and uh, just, just places, yeah, in New York City that don't have that kind of uh, option. So, I'm up in the Bronx uh, at a site that's partnered with uh, with St. Barnabas Hospital, and it's a it's a rooftop farm, uh, with 27 beds, and we grow veggies organically, and then we have a greenhouse as well. So we do microgreens, and then a lot of the seedlings for for that farm, and then there's uh, five other farms that we have too. So a lot of a lot of seedlings in the beginning of the season and and the end of the season too. So. Yeah, that's a, a brief intro to what I do. Um, 
Yeah, Kristen, if you wanna continue, sure. 27 beds is a lot on a rooftop. That's actually really impressive. Yeah, I have some photos too I can share. Let me see if I remember how to do oh, this. Please. Yeah. Um, you might need permission to share your screen. Yeah. Did you, were you made a host? I'm not sure. No, I think anyone should be able to share their screen. Sorry. Yeah, all participants can share their screen. Well, while you're doing that, I'll, I'll just talk. Yeah. Um, and then when your pictures come up, I'll stop. Um, but I know we're supposed to say a little bit about how we got into this work. Um, so I grew up in Queens. I'd be very curious to know where y'all are from, um, where you're tuning in from today. And my school had a concrete um, play yard that we were allowed to run on. And then there was this like one grassy spot and we were not allowed to like even touch that grass like at all. Um, and that to me growing up was like very normal. It was only later that I realized like, oh, you know, that's not so normal. Like it, we should be able to like plant things in spaces and like explore in nature. And um, I kind of like grew up with this, like wanting to have a connection to nature and being super curious about it and like kind of being a little bit at odds with like what was being taught, right? Like, oh, so you're naturally curious about what's growing over there? good for you, but stay on the concrete. And that like never really sat super well for me. And so when I became like a teacher, uh, I was a teacher at high school later. Um, it was like, I just wanted to get the, my students outside. Like that was really what I was most interested in. My very first job or one of them was actually on a farm in Queens. So I see you guys, some, some folks from Woods, awesome. Okay, Woodside and um, Ridgewood. So some Queens people here today. Um, and so I worked on this farm in Queens and like kids would come from all over the city and they would see farm animals. If you grew up, you probably have been to it. It's called the Queens County Farm if you grew up in Queens. And like kids would come and they would check out the animals and they would see what was growing there. And then they would like go away and think that's what a farm was. And, um, and that's why I really liked being involved in the school gardens program because it was like, no, no, like anywhere you are, we can make a farm. And any space you have, we can make a farm. And if you wanna grow food, that's great. If you don't want to do food and you want to do flowers or you just want to do herbs or you want to do, I don't know, something else entirely, like that's also fine. Um, so it was kind of cool because we get to be really creative with the spaces that people have to work with, and like reinvent what it means to be an urban farmer. Um, Anthony, you want to do pictures so we could see some urban farms in action? Cool. Yeah, that I, is my screen shared now? Yes, it's okay. like yeah. your desktop. <laughs> there you go. Nice. Like amateur at this. <laughs> so yeah, this Even is more. a rooftop. Um, can, it, can everybody see that? Yeah. OK, so this is uh, in the beginning of the season. I oh, know this is like halfway through. Got some peppers. And this is like towards oh. the, the back side of the roof. And then in the front, on the far side, that's that's where the greenhouse is. And uh, yeah, um, so there's some collard greens. So we do everything in successions. Uh, well, these these collard greens are actually still up there and this is in the beginning of the season. So those were seedlings like you all planted probably on Governor's Island. And then they just keep going throughout the, um, I think we'll keep them in through the winter as well. Um, some kale too, that's no longer there. And this is today, so it's looking a little, I don't know if you can see the collard greens, they're still on there, but yeah, it's um, a lot of cover crop now. Um, we still got some herbs too, and salad greens and um, uh, mescaline greens, as well as some last of the peppers, but those will soon be all harvested and We'll plant some alliums like garlic and onions. Um, so this is the greenhouse during the summer. Those are some microgreens, which is uh, 
primarily what I'm doing now and have been doing since since the summer. We had to, you can see the, the, the skyline view there. We had to take the walls off because it was getting so hot and it's probably like uh, 70 degrees in there right now. So it gets super hot during the summer. And yeah, that's that's it for the photos. And uh, yeah, just some more on the, the background to uh, see someone ask the question about the hospital. Um, yeah, uh, it, anyone actually has access to, to the roof. Um, it's it's kind of casual if, if someone, so I'll explain some more about how it's set up. It's partnered with St. Barnabas and we also do a, uh, a farm stand which is very similar to the, the Grown YC farm stands. Uh, there's even youth employees and it's essentially the same, but we're supplying all the produce. And um, often, or there's always something from the roof, but we'll take other things. Um, like a lot of crops do better on the ground. So we have a ground farm on Wards Island and then one in Brownsville too. Uh, so we'll take crops from there, depending on what we don't grow on the roof. And so we have the farm stand inside the hospital, or it's um, the building we're on is a health and wellness center, which is uh, part of a, a kind of collective of a teaching kitchen and a gym, which are all open to the public too. And the, the farm stand is open to the public and hospital patients, hospital staff, anyway. And then we do a food pantry as well. So <clears throat> the farm stands on Wednesday and then Thursdays we do our, our uh, food pantry. So whatever is left that we don't sell, we we give out we give away, as well as some other dry goods too. And um, yeah, so it's it's very involved with the community. And uh, yeah, there's it, that's a challenge too. I think is um, getting getting the word out there that it's not just it secluded to the to the hospital itself because it's inside the hospital building so um but we get we get a lot of people coming through so it's always the tricky thing about rooftops it's like when you have even with schools like it, people don't know it's up there it's not like when it's on the, the street level and people are walking by and they can see it it's always like harder to message out that there's a rooftop um garden going on even if it's really cool <laughs> definitely yeah that's that's been something that's come up e even now when I mentioned like oh yeah this is you know just above you people are <laughs> pretty shocked if they don't know about it and it's nice to be able to just have people come up there too like there's mm -hmm. um previously it, it wasn't like that so oh. Anthony do you get food from the farms for the pantry or is it mostly dry goods? It's it's a vegetables. lot of vegetables. Vegetables, okay. Half and half. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and I think um I want to lift up Jess's question. Is your your farm stand finishing up for the season too? So we'll we're finishing up the summer season and there'll be a winter season as well, which will be um, microgreens primarily and some other storage crops. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm psyched. It's, um, it's quite new news. So uh, it's good to keep it going. A lot of people that are, we have a CSA too. So people are wondering if it's gonna continue or not. Uh, yeah, it's great. How do they transport the, the produce from the Brownsville land farm to your location? Do you guys have a kind of a distribution system in place? Yeah, we, we have vans and okay. we have certain days where we'll, we'll do deliveries. Nice. Mm -hmm. Which is all the farmers doing the deliveries. So it's a lot of work. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine so. Um, for those of you that don't know too, um, Project Eats was a, a producer in the Green Market program for several years um, at the Sunset Park farm or at the 
Sunset Park Green Market, and then also um, I think that they participated in our Rockefeller Center Green Market um, for a while. But yeah, it's great that honestly that you have your own outlets and that you have you know farm stands that you're able to set up. I think that it's really cool to have the the direct connection between those and the the sites that you're growing at. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, actually, there's talks about uh, outsourcing some of like some storage crops as well. So it might be some on <laughs> might be a grow and whiskey customer. <laughs> Still a, a connection too. It's by it, there's a farm stand in Fordham Plaza. Is that right? There was a green market in Fordham Plaza. It's actually closed now. Oh, um, right. Yeah, unfortunately. Mm. I heard someone talking about that because we distribute health bucks as well with the EBT program. Mm -hmm. Some people would save them to go there or other ground YC sites. So, yeah. Oh, that's an interesting situation so you distribute health bucks but you're not necessarily able to redeem them are you no we can redeem them too okay but sometimes people want to use them for like we're only vegetables so they'll go to union square or some of got the bigger it. green markets got it oh i think i might have interrupted you while you were talking about um how did you get into urban ag and how did you get um, connected into farming? Me? Yes, Anthony. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so I started f getting into farming. I, I lived in Korea for, for three years. Um, I think Jessica also did this, teaching English after, after uh, college. And I met some folks that did that as a means of travel. So I jumped on that and it's, I was like, okay, this is a, a way of cheaply traveling and staying in places that aren't very touristic. And um, I didn't really have any farming or that much gardening experience before that, but fell in love with it made some, met some really great people in Korea. Um, some people that had moved out of Seoul and started farming in the nearby country and they um they yeah they had a, a csa that they had in seoul and they just I don't, they were living the life and it was very inspiring so i kept doing that and then went to japan for a bit and did the same thing and met some other really cool farmers and other people interested in the same thing and so i decided to pursue a job back in the states and uh, i moved to oregon to portland and uh, kept doing a lot of volunteer work and eventually found a, a farm gig out there. And I did that for a season. Uh, and then I went traveling again in Europe and um, wanted to move back to the States. And then I found all these cool things going on in New York and yeah, I decided to, to move there and start working for Grow NYC. And that was a great introduction into to what's going on here. and. Um, urban farming and just food equity in general. And so that's been my main interest is um, providing, that's I think always been an interest is supplying food to areas that don't have access to it and at an affordable rate too. So I just always wondered how that was possible. I knew there was a possibility, but now I'm starting to see the, the details on that and uh, yeah it's really interesting and uh, fulfilling for sure with this current job seeing people going from uh, not knowing what what vegetables are like literally and then uh, you know these same people keep coming back every week and asking questions and learning how to cook in the kitchen as well so yeah it's very full circle Anthony, I don't know if you're prepared to talk about this, but <laughs> I'll ask it anyways. Um, how, um, how does Project Eats go about trying to, to make the farm stand as affordable as possible? So, like, I, you know, I imagine the labor for growing produce in the city is actually pretty expensive and just the real estate itself would be expensive. So how, how does that all work? Uh, I think it comes down to the, to the partnerships so 
every every site has a partner. Uh, like I said, mine is the hospital, and then Brownsville is um, um, what are they called? It's, it's lower income housing. I'm free, uh, Marcus Garvey Apartments, and mm -hmm. um, Wards Island is partnered with Help USA, which is uh, an organization helping people find jobs. Uh, there's a homeless shelter next door. So the, the site partners definitely help with the, um, the real estate aspect. I'm not sure exactly how that works, but yeah, otherwise it, it would be pretty expensive. Um, and it has to do with the whole, the mission of the organization too. And then at the farm stands, we offer a 40% discount if, if you want a community discount um which people often take and it's great uh, we we try to get people no matter what to to buy to buy something or to get something even if it's not exactly profitable i think a lot of it comes from donors so um yeah the farm stands aren't generating a ton of income um but we have with the csas i think that kind of offsets some of that too Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's interesting. Kristen, I'm curious about um, the school gardening program. Um, I actually don't know the history of gardens in schools and like when that started, how Grow NYC got into it. Because I think you might, besides you and Harlem Grow, and you, you're like the only people who are doing this in the city. Is that correct? Oh, and um, Edible Garden, Edible Schoolyard. There's a good, there's a good number of us. Um, so the first school garden, I think goes all the way back to like the 1800s and it was in Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan. And so um, I don't know for those who like, like history, I kind of do um, where it was. So 10th Avenue in um, Manhattan used to be called Death Avenue. And it was like an extremely busy street. There were freight trains like on the street level that would you know, go up and down. And they used to have to have a person on a horse like riding in front of the train to like clear people out of the way. Um, so super, <laughs> super industrial area and like lots of goods coming and going and transportation and the streets were crowded and it was very unsanitary because there was not like public waste systems at that point. So people were dumping waste right into the street. And um, this person, uh, Franny, Parsons, I'm going to double check this name because of course I'm talking about it and I can't remember it, but she said she was like teaching this little school right there and she's like, you know what, we're going to put a learning garden right in the middle of this and, and she did and so she had, you know, she would take her students out during the day and they would work in the garden, it's just like the only bright green spot in this area otherwise and so um. So there's a history of it in New York City. Um, and then I think like, you know, Edible Schoolyard came onto the scene many years ago and like that changed the game. People were like, wait a second, like we can do this too. And so there's there's us, there's a couple of other organizations that are doing this. We're the only one that doesn't actually send our team to the school. So, um, you know, often what happens is like there'll be a nonprofit who will say, okay, um, we're going to send like two people, three people, we're going to build the garden, we're going to run the garden. Um, but our motto is, or our philosophy is that we're going to teach adults in the school community how to do this in any way that makes sense for them. And then we're going to let them do their own gardening initiatives at school. And so uh, we probably work with the most school gardens out of everybody who's doing this in this space. We have helped over 860 schools in all five boroughs to start gardens. And the way that we do that is we do workshops. So anybody, this year they've all been virtual, so anybody can tune in from anywhere to learn in their gardening base, but they might also be like how to teach in a garden because many teachers are new to that. Um, we did one last year on like how to control pests or like how to do composting or um, how to start a garden from food scraps. That one was really popular. Um, and then we'll also like people can call us if they're just getting started and it's totally free. They'd be like, I have this little 
tiny, like it's two feet, what can I grow in there? And we'll like help them make a plan and a design for the space and connect them to all the free resources that are available. Um, so, and they can also call us when they have a problem. So sometimes we'll get a text message and it's like a picture of a bug and it's eating everything and they'll wanna know what they can do about it or maybe they're, they wanna expand. So um, we're kind of here to help them get started at any point, but it's nice that, you know, about half of schools now have some kind of a garden, whether that's like a window ledge in a classroom or something that's a little bit bigger than that half. So our goal is for all of them. And I think we will get there um, just slowly, but our program's been around for 11 years now and, and we're in half of schools. So I'm curious for the, the people tuning in today, whether your schools have gardens if you're still in schools or whether they had them when you were there. So you can throw that in the chat. So just be super curious to know if you had a school garden. Great, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and Anthony, I, I'm um, kind of tapping onto that. I'm wondering if you know about the history of Project Eats and why you guys started up. Um, and um, what, how, how your work is essential to the communities that you're in. Yeah, uh, Project Eats was started, I believe, 10 years ago. I don't know exactly the amount of time. I confuse it with the, the Bronx site started just two years ago. Um, it's a relatively new building. It's also, apartment housing, lower income apartment housing. So it's half of that and then half of the, uh, the hospital. And yeah, like I said before, they're all set up in, in food desert areas where uh, organic produce is not readily available or in some cases not known about. Um, uh, I think especially the Brownsville site which is a ground farm is, is the most well-known and most used by the community there and has um, community members working there. Uh, sadly, that site is gonna be developed upon by, by the housing, but um, they'll have to move to a smaller site. Um, yeah, that's, um, it's also been kind of a work in progress for the, the Bronx site too, to get more people engaged people from the community engaged and and working there um whether it's volunteering or actually being employed We're actually trying to get some people now from the the apartment housing there to do the the food pantry and possibly the farm stand too um, i kind of took over those roles when some people left so that would be great um yeah they there's been a lot of uh kind of recuperating from from covid and and getting that up and going again. So hopefully next year we get a lot more of that. Kristen, um, I mean, I know personally that you used to be in education. I'm wondering how did you make that jump from, from like teacher to museum to girl and I see now? Um, that is a great question. So. Um, I was, one of my first jobs, my first job that I really liked was at the Queens County Farm. And I was really young, I was like 18 years old. And um, I was leading tours. So I was taking like school kids around and showing them the animals and showing them what was growing. And I loved it. And then um, from there, I, I did a lot of things. I didn't know what I wanted to do at all. Like when I was, I didn't know, I still am not sure. But um, when I was there, I really loved it. And then I went to, I was in college at the time. So I finished school, but I was always kind of back and forth with the Queens County Farm. And then um, I ended up getting like my certification to teach. And so I went into teaching, but I didn't I, I knew that I didn't want to be in a classroom forever. Like I loved being with students. I had, I taught English, um, but I always like worked sustainability into the, whatever we were learning and teaching in the classroom. And I took my kids 
outside as much as possible because like I also wanted to be outside. I didn't want to be in my classroom all day. So, um, you know, we would go out, we would do like sustainability studies in the community to like see what was going. I taught in Rockaway, so that was really fun. Um, Giselle, you can totally ask. I went to Hofstra, which is on Long Island, and I studied geology and creative writing. Um, and I don't know what I thought I was going to do with that combination. Uh, so I, but they were both interesting to me. I was like, oh, okay, so if I study geology, I can go hiking and that's part of my classwork. Great. And if I do creative writing, I can just read books even better. So it was like a really weird combination. And then after that, I went to Queens College to get my teaching certification. Um, so I could, I could take these two things that I had liked so much in college and figure out how to like make a job out of them. Um, and so then I, I finished that program at Queens College, was teaching, and around that time, um, somebody that I'd worked with at the Queens County Farm was leaving. And she asked me, she was like, would you like to come back and run the education program? Like you'd be in charge of all of the field trips. I was like, yes, great. Like, so I went back to the Queens County Farm. Um, and after that, I ended up in the museum world for a little while I was in like an after school teen center. So that was really cool. Like the, we did all these theatrical productions each year and everything was run by like the kids that dropped in. Um, so they like directed plays, they made all of the costumes, they like choreographed the whole shows and then they would be open to the community and free so people could pop in. Um, and that was really fun because you would see like the super shyest kids like transform in a year because they just needed to know that they could yes they could do this and they were going to be great at it and we weren't going to let them fail um and so that was really cool to watch like how they transformed but then anyway so I went into museums as teen center and then when I saw the school gardens position at growing YC I was like oh that's really cool like I was a teacher I was at this farm like I've done like the hands-on experiential education. Like I've done lots of like professional learning opportunities for teachers, but I've also been on the side that like wrote programs that were fun for kids. So like when I was at the transit museum, um, if, if you've ever been there, it's in downtown Brooklyn. And for whatever reason, the transit world is like very male, right? And so I was like, all right, this is fun, but like, let's find really cool female characters like from transportation history and like lift up those stories. Um, so we did like a, a women in STEM series that was a lot of fun. And so it was just like, I looked back at this really odd like work history that I had and I thought well this seems really perfect and so it worked and it's been for over four years for me now at Girl NYC and um in a way like it wasn't until I was in this role that I saw how so much of it connected like you have to have a lot of creativity to think about where to where to fit gardens into school buildings or like when you walk up to a school a lot of them are like, so they're so concrete and you think like, well, how could anything grow over there? Um, and that's when we talk to like a lot of our teachers and parents that want to start gardens, they say to us, we want to have a garden, but everything's concrete. We can't, there's nothing we can do in that space. And you're like, well, actually, <laughs> there's a lot you can do. And there's a lot of other schools have figured out how to do. And so it's collecting all of these really creative solutions that schools have had are coming up with our own creative ones and then helping more schools um, do this. And, and gardens are not just, they are for growing, but they're also for community spaces and you know having events and thinking about like, how do I have people who maybe don't like gardening? Cause that's fair. How can they use the space? Um, and so then I think back to all of the things we did at the teen center and how the goal was to like capture kids and then keep them, right? So like finding something that was of interest to them. So it can be whatever you need it to be for your community. And I think that's one of the, the really fun parts about helping people develop the spaces. So in that very roundabout way, 
think I answered your question. <laughs> you totally did. And speaking of creative work, I know you won't plug it, but I'm going to plug you, Kristen. <laughs> Kristen is, a, is an author. She's written two books. So definitely check them out. Um, uh, at least I know for sure the one is New York Queen centered. We both um, are actually. Oh, both are. Okay, great. Yeah. So definitely check out her work. Um, I'm going to throw this question to the both of you. Um, what are some of the highlights or the best parts of your work? And what are some challenges or gaps in the work that you're doing in the city? Anthony, do you want to go first? Sure. I would say highlights are definitely the, the community, uh, community engagement aspects and experiences that I've had, which I shared a lot within the, uh, the Grand YC role as well. It's just um, meeting people and really noticing how uh, appreciative people are or um, yeah, just just really excited about something that um, I don't want to say I take for granted, but you know, like I mentioned before, people not knowing about vegetables, and, you know what they are. Um, seeing that has definitely been the highlight for me. Um, and challenges, um, I mean, a farming challenge would be uh, pest management. I think I learned a lot about pest management specifically on the roof too, you, you get, it's different. It would be different from uh, what was going on on our ground farms. And uh, with organic farming, it's just, you gotta take care of it or like sacrifice some plants. Otherwise uh, it'll spread pretty quick. Uh, and dealing with the elements too, there's, I feel like there's been some uh, kind of wild weather patterns. And uh, even just last week, it got like up to, 70 degrees so it's just been like a lot of bouncing back and forth uh, that's been interesting too to see what will go longer or what what will go quicker but yeah those those would be the, the challenges anthony before we move from you um if if we gave you a blank check um what would you do <laughs> specifically in the work that you're involved in what would you do differently or what would you spend more money on or invest more I, I would do it more on outreach. Outreach okay. and, uh, with my organization, uh, composting. Mm. We have a relatively small team, so it's been that those have been the two main challenges for me. Mm -hmm. um, I think for for everybody probably um, composting. Uh, I think Kristen or, or somebody mentioned about uh, the Governor's Island composting. Uh, I would love to see that and explore more of what other people are doing just to have something set up that uh is producing usable compost um so yeah that's that's a lot of work and something i'd like to see implemented with project deeds for sure uh kristen pass it to you yeah um okay so i think one of my favorite things and one of the biggest strengths of the school learnings program is people's passion and creativity. So, you know, we'll get like a group who might come to us and say, there is a vacant lot across from the school. We're going to, we're, we're going to tear that fence down. We're, we'll clean it out. Like we don't need any help. We, we'll, we will do it. We just want to see the space being used. And and those groups, like they're so passionate and they just want to do it. There's nothing that's going to stop them except the system itself, right? And so like we, we can, you know, I think sometimes like one of the things that's really frustrating is like you'll have all that passion and enthusiasm and people's willingness to like transform a space. And then the legal process of like who owns the space and are they willing to share it? And like, what are they like? there's it gets kind of tangled and so you know even at a school sometimes it's like oh well you know this space like would be ideal except so there's that space that people are so passionate about stewarding is often in such high demand even if it's not being used which is like a weird frustrating 
harder work because um, there actually could be so much more green space like all across New York City. Um, it's just not easy to access. So that's kind of my, the greatest strength I think is the, the like mountains people are willing to climb to do this work. But I think the biggest frustration is that there are so many mountains for people to climb to do this work. <laughs> so, yeah, same question to you, Kristen. If you had a blank check, what would you invest more money or time in? I would love to create like a huge map that has all of the school gardens across the city, but Ooh. also pictures of exactly what they're doing because. Sometimes like when people come to us, they're like, oh, I want to do a garden, but nobody here has a garden anywhere near us. And we're like, 10 people have a garden near you. You just can't always see it, right? And so mm. like something that people could look and see exactly where they are in the city and then say like, oh, here's five and oh, look what they're doing. So you can actually like see it. And then you'll have an example, like almost maybe on your own block of what's possible to do. Wow in your space so so like a google maps for school gardens yes that's almost 3d because it's bringing yeah. all these gardens like it's to life nice. so that people can, and it's like sometimes people just need to see what other people are doing to mm. feel inspired mm. like you might think something is impossible until you see like oh look these five people did it and it's working and it's really cool and they they didn't climb the mountain and they just blasted right through it so Helping them to see what's possible, I think would be great. Thanks. Um, one last question for me. Um, if, if folks on the call or folks who watch this later on, if they're looking to get into a, a similar field or kind of doing the same work that you all are doing, what things, um, like if you could, I guess if you could speak to your like past self, what things would you, um, have our youth like consider, have in mind while um, pursuing um, work in the food space, in the in the farming, the ag, the urban ag space too? One thing that I really like about the urban ag space is that it really values learned experience. So you don't necessarily have to have a degree or go to a school or take a course. Like you could go volunteer in a community garden, or just pick up a book and like learn, you know, and, and that's, and that all counts. Like it all adds to like your experience of in urban ag, it's just the doing of it, which is really cool. If you wanted to work more specifically in like education or with students, um, that's where I think it's helpful to start gathering that experience. Maybe that's volunteering, maybe that's offering like, hey, I, I'm local. Um, I see your school has a garden. Like I would love to lead like a lesson one day a week. Like I think not being afraid to be a little pushy, um, <laughs> you know, and just to, to say like, hey, maybe this thing that I'm trying to do, it doesn't exist, but I can make it exist if I just find like the right audience that's willing to, to give it a try with me particularly, right? Um, and also that, the urban ag space is like a super creative space. So if you have some idea that maybe doesn't exist yet, right? Pitch it. You know, there's, I think there's definitely people who are willing to like give your idea a try. And it's just about making all the right, it's a very small world, urban ag. Like it's not like unusual that like people I worked with 15 years ago at the Queens County Farm, like I might bump into them again at some other like organization. So getting to know the organizations and who can help you and pitching your ideas and like not being afraid to, to do that. I think there's room for it. Um, and there's still a lot of, and make a cheesy pun. There's still a lot of room to grow in this space. So if, <laughs> sorry, I'll, I'll stop there before I make another cheesy pun. <laughs> oh, that was great. Yeah, I wish I had a cheesy pong to, to jump on that. Um, yeah, my advice is along the same lines as you, Kristen. Uh, I also am a creative writing major. So it seemingly has no connection to urban ag or farming. But um, after listening to you, especially, I think it's it's not necessarily true. 
Um, like you said, it takes, uh, it, I think it just takes a, an interest. If you have any kind of interest, um, there's so many options in New York to volunteer and to just get involved. I mean, it could be on the roof of your building and you don't even know. So um, yeah, just get out there and search around, travel around the city. You'll find something and just start volunteering. And it's, yeah, I, I found all this through through learned experience and, and traveling. Um, yeah, and another thing I forgot to mention is uh, Project Eats was started by an artist, uh, Linda Good Bryant. She, she started a, um, she's an African American woman and she started uh, an art gallery in the seventies, I think 74. And so she, she also had no background in farming and uh, she's decided to, she's still involved, involved in art, but is concentrating more on food equity. And that's the reason why she started Project Eats. And there's, so there's still kind of an art side to it as well. They do gallery work that involves um, hydroponics. They had one during the summer that was, yeah, set up in Manhattan somewhere. So yeah, there's I'd like, I guess what I'm trying to say is you can do, you can have other interests as well and, and still be able to, to get involved and implement those interests too. Nice. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to open up the floor for anyone who wants to ask any questions like I put in the chat, feel free to unmute and ask your questions or you can type them in the chat. Um, and don't be shy, no question. I know, I know. <laughs> I do think it's really cool how you all, um, um, I, I think I remember being a youth and um, thinking about college and thinking about how like monumental whatever decision I make for college is and like how it like will direct the, it's basically like, this is like my, my life's path and, and if I choose it, that's where I'm going to end up. Um, but it's been interesting as an adult on the other end, um, thinking how, really you can be whoever you want <laughs> and that you you are only limited by like yourself and by what you want to do and so um i think that's actually a really good thing to think of because i think a lot of you right now are applying for college and are trying to figure out what decisions to make um i think you can hear from the adults in the room that <laughs> that any decisions you make don't 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 are not like Term, like they're not a one, a one, one and all, like that you can definitely like change your mind. Um, and yeah, don't get mad with yourself if you go into something and you realize, oh, this is not what something for me. Um, but you have all this other knowledge that you're picking up from volunteering, from, from being part of your community that you can fall back on. Um, and if that, for me, that was really encouraging. I really wish at 20, someone had said that to me, then I wouldn't have had like a quarter life crisis at 25. Um. <laughs> I think all of us feel that way. I feel like it's so funny thinking back on that time of just like, I didn't know, you know, one tenth of the careers that existed out there. I had no idea that my job existed, that any of this all existed. Um, and it, yeah, it doesn't, your college, you know, path doesn't set you on a specific trajectory that can never be changed. Like at any time it is possible to change and get more in line with what you're passionate about and what you really want to be doing work in. And, and I would just encourage everybody to never, never feel limited, um, in the scope of what you can do based on your past. Like you can always change directions and change, um, and change what you're interested in and learn more, you know, there's so much out there and you just, you can't know it all when, when you're like forced to make these decisions at this age. And like not being afraid to just try out your interests and see how interested in your interests you actually are. <laughs> you know, like there's definitely been things that I'm like, oh, that looks really cool. 
Okay, here's like a silly example. Like there used to be a lot of TV shows about ghost hunting. And I was like, well, that looks really <laughs> interesting. Like, I, not that I want to make a career out of it, but maybe I'll, you know, maybe that's maybe. So I found like a meetup group, which used to be a thing. And I like showed up and we were going to do a ghost hunt. And I was like, there for about 10 minutes. And I was like, this is not for me. Like, not at all. Like, it was like one thing to watch this on TV, but I don't want to do this at all. And so I like basically ran screaming from the house. Like, but like, the thing is, now I don't have to wonder, right? Now I know, okay, I tried that. I'm good. There's other things I'd rather spend time doing. <laughs> so it's okay. You can laugh about it later and it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I like quickly looking up ghost hunting needles. <laughs> Just don't mind yeah, me. <laughs> considering a career change right now. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm going to say here, I am an avid Scooby-Doo watcher. I, I won't judge you. I love Scooby-Doo. <laughs> I'm at my age, so it's totally up my alley. <laughs> oh, no shame in it, right? Like, in whatever no it is you find interest, you're like, that's you. That's your thing. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, if there are no questions, I think we're going to head out and let it, let folks have dinner and enjoy the rest of your evening. But Kristen and Anthony, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we loved hearing about your journeys and about where you all are and the work that you're doing. And I know it's giving um, some folks your ideas about what other things that they can get involved in. Great. Yeah, you're very welcome. And I'm gonna put my mm -hmm. email in the chat because if you are like me when I was like, not this old. I was very shy and I didn't want to ask my questions out. So I'm going to put it here so you can always reach out. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, thanks, y'all. Good to see some familiar faces and new faces. Yeah. And yeah, I'm, I'll do the same. Um, if anybody has any questions they want to reach out or if they want to come up and check out the farm any Monday to Friday, mm -hmm. please do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah I want to. I do that at some point. I've been needing to all season, Anthony. I really need to get up there. Yeah, that's all good. Sure I mean, I'm thinking we might add you all to our list for next year to come and visit. We'll hit yeah. you guys up. That's um, great. Yeah. yeah. And I just want um, to remind us. Oh, go, Jess. Oh. oh, I just want to do reminders too. So, mm -hmm. you know, go ahead, go ahead to too. No, you. <laughs> all right. So, we are finishing up the season, as you all mm -hmm. know. Um, we'll have farm stands through this weekend, and then we have Wednesday farm stands next week before Thanksgiving, and then we're really scaling back to just the, the um, two winter farm stands plus uh, Crown Heights that goes through December. Um, we are planning and having, hopefully, a gathering on 1130. November 30th on Tuesday from 3.30 to 6.30. And, and we're hoping to do that in person. We still are waiting on approval for that, um, but I will be sending an email out to all of you guys about that. Um, it'll be like the final certificates of completion for the season. We'll be giving out some awards and we're also gonna be going through some stats for the individual farm stands, how much produce you sold, how many pounds were donated, um, you know, how many, how much of your sales were comprised of um, nutrition benefits like SNAP and health bucks and um, FMNP checks. Um, it's just really interesting information, which could also feed into your resumes. It'll be some good stats for that as well. Um, so I'm really hoping that you can all make it just carve out that time. It will either be in person or if we have to, we'll, it'll be virtual, but I'm really hoping it'll be in person. So look out for that email. Um, in that email, I'm also going to be sending out a link with exit interview questions. And really all that is are just some questions of your about your experience this year, any suggestions you have for improvements for our program for next year, um, you know, the types of information that you would like to see or, you know, suggestions for topics that we could include in these, um, these workshops. Um, but yeah, I would really encourage all of you to fill that out. But yeah, just keep checking your email for an email from me. It should be coming in the next few days, I'm hoping, um, once we have this nailed down. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Jess. Um, and just, you know, in closing, 
I want to rem remind you of what Kristen said, the food ag, the urban ag world, the food world, the, the New York City food world, the urban ag world, the agriculture world in New York City is very small. So um, if you ever find yourself in a position to like interested in in, in this in, in some of this work um yeah just let us know reach out to to Kristen and to Anthony reach out to any of the people who we've had as part of our workshops and you can say hey I attended one of your workshops with Grow NYC that really just like helps to I mean it's not a guarantee that you'll get the job but it really helps set you apart if people know have some kind of like touch point with you so that's my encouragement um all right Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Bye.